grabbing something to eat or something to drink. Now's a good time. And uh, good morning.
Good morning, everyone. So we're going to get started. Good morning. My name is Craig Willingham. I'm the deputy director here at the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. We're a research and action center based here at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. And we focus on a wide range of food policy related topic areas. Uh, one of which is the area of democracy. And while on the surface, the concept of democracy may not immediately connect with the concept of food policy, we see a robust food system as one that is informed by the democratic will of the folks who are working, you know, purchasing food, who are producing food in the food system. And with that in mind, we thought that it would be a really opportunistic time to talk about our hopes, our expectations, and our cautious optimism about the 2020 elections. We saw some shifts in the midterm elections, particularly at the federal level and in New York, some very radical shifts. But what does all that mean for food, food policy, and many of the other issues that uh, the various constituencies around the city and around the country are looking to see movement on. And that's what we're looking for, forward to talking about today. What are the sorts of things that we can expect to see and, and what are the things that, that we think that elected officials should be concerned about moving into the 2020 elections. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction of our keynote speaker. and. Um, for more information, you can look at the handouts that are available over there, which has speaker bios for all of our panelists today. Uh, today, our keynote speaker is Karen Spangler, Director of Policy and Program Operations at Food Policy Action, where she leads the development of Food Policy Action's annual scorecard, conducts policy analysis for FPA, and coordinates outreach and digital advocacy. Before joining FPA, Karen worked on healthy food access, urban agriculture, and policy in Michigan. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Food Policy Action, they're a, a wonderful organization that does a great job at tracking what legislators are actually doing related to food policy and, and putting together uh, really informative documentation about voting records, about policy stances, et cetera. And I highly recommend that you check out their site. So. With that, I'm going to invite Karen up on stage and we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. So before I dive all the way in, um, I want to explain a little bit about food policy action and some of the things that, that I'll focus on today. So, one of the things that we can do, both through our educational tools, as Craig mentioned, our annual scorecard, our Eater's Guide to Congress, um, is that we can get involved in electoral work. Uh, it allows us to make the connection for voters between uh, why an issue matters, how a legislator voted, and what that means for, for you uh, when you're in the ballot box. Uh, so we started out first with our polling information. So we want to start out with um, things that are um, starting out with uh, objective information about how our messages resonate with audience, audiences. Uh, our polling information from Lake Research Partners, the firm that we work with has worked a lot on these issues, um, indicates that messages around safe, healthy, affordable food for all can persuade low turnout voters in suburban areas, um, especially unmarried, college-educated women of all races with and without children. And why that's important is that we want to get involved in areas where we can make a difference in an election. Uh, we want to invest our resources where it can make a difference in electing food leaders. This issue can also be a powerful mobilizer uh, for women of color to get out and vote. And so we're looking at both persuading and mobilizing low turnout voters. And we know from polling research that voters expect incumbents to vote for good food policies. And when they find out that their representatives voted otherwise, they are rightfully angry. 
Um, the best way to reach these voters who are busy, as all of us are, is to invest in paid targeted advertising on social media. So that model informs um, some of the work that we have done in the past elections and that we see as important going into future elections. So we're looking at a, a vital slice of voters in 2020. Um, the ability to um, both persuade and mobilize can change the outcome of the election. In an age of a lot of political advertising, we focused on providing objective information and empowering this important slice of voters. So our educational tools, like an Eater's Guide to Congress, which is our six-year scorecard, so we looked at since Food Policy Action was founded in 2012, what are the votes that House members have taken on uh, a full range of food issues? So these provide objective information on voting records, and we connect these votes to kitchen table issues in targeted advertising so people are aware of candidates' voting records and can decide for themselves. Closer to Election Day, we focused on mobilizing voters. We work a lot with um, chefs and as advocates. Uh, they're a really powerful um, communicator, and they created videos with us that emphasized values, so how important it is to vote, what are the values they're bringing with them into the voting booth, um, whether their value is safe, affordable, healthy food, or whether the value is civic engagement in the process and making sure your voice is heard. They also talked a lot about providing information to make a concrete plan to ensure that people actually voted and that these food voters are getting to the polls. Food can be an issue that, mo that moves people. It, doesn't move everyone, unfortunately. Um, but as so many of these close races recently, just in the 2018 midterms have shown, as little as one to 2% can change the outcome of an election. So we focused on these low turnout voters so that our, our message uniquely speaks to you. So food touches every important issue, health, immigration, the environment, the economy, um, and we link them in a way that's especially important to these key voters. So especially uh, parents, they're putting food on the table three times a day. Uh, healthy, safe, affordable food matters to everyone, but often voters take it for granted. It's when there's a dramatic disruption in the food system, um, like the recent uh, outbreaks of foodborne illnesses just before Thanksgiving. Um, there was the salmonella outbreak in Turkey that sickened uh, at least 164 people. And then of course the nationwide romaine lettuce recall after um, 13 hospitalizations across 11 states. So when that happens, it becomes very apparent. Um, this relates to 2020 in that food can be, uh, can play a role as a campaign issue in targeted places. And it's not gonna be uh, the same in every place or for every audience. So that's why we're focusing in on messages and communicators that can persuade women uh, especially low turnout women voters by showing them what the legislators' records are and motivator, motivate voters who might be on the fence about turning out. Um, so finding especially important audiences for get out the vote messages. Targeted messages to voters for whom these issues matter can persuade and mobilize and that's what we're gonna take into 2020 as well. Thank you. Technical support, always appreciated. <laughs> so some of the lessons that we learned from 2018, as I mentioned, we worked, looked at targeted races where we could make a difference. So, and based on our polling, we spoke to a slice of low turnout voters. We tested on different audiences, tested different messages around food, and we found that our messages had the potential to persuade specifically white married women in the suburbs and to mobilize white unmarried women and women of color to get out the vote. So when we're looking at persuading or mobilizing these kind of slices of voters, that one to 2%, um, that's, that's what we're testing and um, working on, on honing in on. We chose some specific close races because of these demographics and worked with some of the communicators that I mentioned to stay focused on a few key audiences. 
we really did a lot of digital media. It's an increasingly important part of our everyday lives. Uh, we're living our lives online, whether it's Facebook or shopping or um, communicating with friends. And so digital campaigns are an increasingly powerful political tool because they meet voters where they are, which if you are like me is usually looking at your phone. Um, so our digital campaign targeting this slice of eligible voters with messages of safe, healthy, affordable food, and the ways that it reaches our plates helped make a difference in two really closely watched congressional races, uh, in the, some of the most closely watched congressional races in the country. So we chose these two close races, Virginia 7 and uh, California 25. So uh, our friend on your left here is Dave Bratt uh, and Steve Knight here on the right. So we called them right for the picking. This is our internal joke. Um, we consider these races because of the food, because of the numbers truly terrible records. That's where we start. We start with looking at what's their score on our scorecard annually and their lifetime score. What have they actually done? And we focus on house races as the arena where we can have the most impact uh, because of the, the size of the investment in the race. And we closely tracked um, toss up or leaning races throughout the year um, to see how they developed. So in Virginia 7, uh, Congressman Dave Bratt had an 8% score, uh, lifetime score, on food policy actions, Eater's Guide to Congress. So he had a lot of bad votes to choose from. You can imagine this is an 8%. But he specifically voted four times against preserving food safety rules and to make it drastically harder to enact any new regulations that would include food safety, including food safety specifically. And in California's 25th district, Congressman Steve Knight had a 32% lifetime score on an Eater's Guide to Congress. And he actually voted the same four times against safer food and also three times against pesticide protection in our water and another four times voted to make it harder for consumers to know what's in their food. So things like labeling and transparency. So we felt pretty confident that uh, we had a lot to talk about, uh, about these people's records. Uh, we monitored these races closely as they developed and we chose places where we could make a difference and no one else was going to speak to the specific slice of voters that we could reach. So our ability to reach suburban uh, married white women with a persuasion message and to mobilize unmarried women and women of color fit with the demographics of each district. So we're starting with who's terrible and then looking at on top of that, where can we make the difference? Some of our biggest assets uh, for communicating this election season included validators who can speak to target audiences, particularly the chefs that I mentioned before. And we find that messages resonate better when it's someone the audiences relate to, either that they see frequently or um, that they have something in common with. So we were really honored to have the help of our diverse chef network highlighting their recipes, called the recipes for voting to these individuals, urging them to get to the polls and vote. So this included um, Andrew Zimmern, uh, who you, a lot of you might know from uh, television's Bizarre Foods, Katie Button, who is a chef in Asheville, North, North Carolina, Joy Crump uh, in Fredericksburg, uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. So she was really close to the Dave Brad target audience that we were looking at. And then Marie Iniguez, who's the chef owner of Bocadillo Slow Roasted in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And um, all of these people have worked with us before um, advocating in Congress, uh, especially around issues of um, food access and affordability. So this is something that they felt really strongly about. In these videos, they shared why as chefs voting is important to them and the concrete steps that they were taking to make sure they got to the polls. Andrew shared an educational message with concrete steps on how he was setting aside time to vote. And he not only filmed the video for us, but he shared it on his social media platforms, which helped drive traffic to our website and our other assets. So working kind of all together as a digital campaign. Um, and this is the kind of, here's the kind of resources, like I said, where we're providing information and then also speaking to values. These videos felt really personal. Um, Katie Marie and Joy also each had something unique to share about their personal experiences um, and their values and how those inform their vote. 
An Eater's Guide to Congress, Food Policy Action is best known for our, our scorecards. And in 2018, we published an Eater's Guide to Congress which covered 55 House votes since our first scorecard in 2012. So for members who have been in the House for all six years, they have taken multiple votes on these issues. Like I mentioned with Dave Bratt and Steve Knight, they've had the chance to vote multiple times on food safety, on pesticides, on hunger. So for many members, this is not a one-year snapshot. This is a long-term view of positions they've consistently taken on the most important food issues. We provide information, but we didn't want to stop there. So right next to information on the legislators' votes, we included questions to ask about these votes, had state-specific uh, fact sheets on the impact, uh, and immediately linked to actions they could take, like ways to contact their legislator easily through email or social media, uh, and linking to uh, voting resources so they can actually take action on election day. So for busy members of the public, especially uh, people with children, abstract policy issues really come down to simple solutions, like whether or not the food that they are purchasing and putting on the kitchen table for their families is safe and affordable. And Americans often assume that our food is safe, that the federal protections we have in place are strong enough, but as these recent outbreaks have demonstrated, that's not always true. Uh, and it's in crises like these that the importance of federal protections become really visible to eaters. So uh, even before these most recent outbreaks, um, we had issues with chicken, cookies, spices, um, and given that, why would you vote for a congressperson that wants to dilute or weaken food, food safety laws? Um, so these are examples of some of the social media um, assets that we used in our targeted advertising. Issues that can seem fairly abstract, um, issues that can seem fairly abstract like regulatory rollbacks or annual budgets and appropriations can mean that the food that gets to our plates isn't really safe because there is less funding for food safety inspections, fewer programs to help producers meet food safety standards, and reducibility on the part of the FDA to respond to outbreaks. So we work really hard to connect the real life consequences of votes in Congress. So that's the analysis the FPA is providing to the public so they can make informed decisions about their own members. An additional layer for 2020 will be administrative accountability. So of course, it's in everyone's minds that the next presidential election is coming up. Um, and in addition to congressional issues, um, administrative issues that the, um, that the executive agencies have the chance to um, have the authority over, you know, that will also be kind of up for a referendum. Um, this, has, this is like things like the regulatory rollbacks that we covered in our State of the Plate report in 2018. Um, this is something that the Trump administration will be directly accountable for to voters. Um, to use the food safety example previously, consumers um, are taking for granted that the FDA workers kill, process, and pack more chickens or turkeys per minute. And this uh, change was made over the objections of food safety advocates, animal welfare organizations, and workers. Because, you know, as all of us know, when something is a lot faster, it's harder to do well. And that has real consequences, as we can see. There's also growing demand um, from consumers for organic and humanely produced food. Um, just recently in the election, uh, California voted to expand um, the protections around space for animals in production. Um, so just, but just last year, the Trump administration withdrew a rule for the National Organic Program, which had been 10 years in the making for uh, organic livestock and poultry producers to give animals more room and access to the outdoors. So consumers are concerned about animal welfare and they believe that when they buy organic, that seal, they can trust that these animals were treated well. Uh, and then finally, parents and scientists are concerned about pesticide exposure for children at a time where their brains are just forming. Um, but despite these concerns, um, the Trump administration reversed a ban on chlorpyrifos, which is a nerve agent pesticide. It was one of the first things they did. Um, and recently, this fall pushed up the EPA's director of child health. Uh, so there will be plenty in, for voters to consider in 2020 about the real tangible impacts of the rather complicated federal rulemaking process. So, uh, and I 
illustrated this just with another example of um, some of the, the communications, the digital assets that we used. Bottom line is that food might never rise to the top issue for any election unless there's like an outbreak of food poisoning in that district just before election day. Um, you know, mostly we are going to see the economy or healthcare, some of these um, major broad issues. But what we can do, what FPA does, and why we, we think our mes message is so critical, is we target the voters who don't usually go to the polls and who believe their elected official is good on the issue and they're angry when they find that they're not. And that motivates these voters to get out and vote. So our scorecard gives them a resource to get the facts. Our targeted work gives them the information in an easy to digest format. And our polling tells us this is a motivating issue for key voters who can make a difference in a close election. And food shouldn't be a partisan issue. But especially as we saw through our six year scorecard, um, House Republicans in particular have made it so. Um, in these 55 separate votes, House Republicans shot down legislation written to preserve federal food stamps for hungry children and families, safeguard the environment, protect consumers, and support smaller acreage farmers. So this is one of the reasons that um, on average, House Republicans got a score of 20% um, on an Eater's Guide to Congress, is these repeated actions um, that they have taken and that the leadership has taken. So in 2020, we will be um, communicating this and looking at races where we can make a difference. And these are the kind of issues that will um, uh, have a chance to make a difference in these really close elections. All right. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you so much. Very informative. And again, the policy action provides some really great resources to understand the various policy positions and policy actions of our uh, elected officials. So next up, I'm going to invite Dennis Derrick up to provide a little bit more context uh, with respect to a perspective from New York City. And um, Dennis is a professor of professional practice at the Milano School of International Affairs at the New School. And he's also the founder of Corbin Hill Food Project, which I know many of you in this room are familiar with. So Dennis, come on up. Craig, uh, you can't hear me just snap. Okay, because I've just also had all the surgery and I'm not hearing as well as I would like to think that others are hearing me. Okay, and for that reason, I also, um, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Craig, for inviting us here. And, uh, and Karen, you know, what, what you present this morning and what I'm going to be talking about and others are going to be talking about shows the complexity of the issues that we're faced with in the society in general around food and the role that it plays. And without your work, it isn't possible, it makes it impossible for me to even start thinking about where should we be after 2020 and where we should be in 2030. And so within that context, it's within that context that I would like to make a few remarks. Uh, first of all, I think the issue of accountability is extraordinarily important. And I think that that is really part of, and for us in New York City, in New York State, uh, we are in a position where we can, we think we can add to your agenda as opposed to saying we want a new agenda. Uh, because I don't think any of this is one dimensional at all. Okay. So at the state level, for the first time we have the Democrats are in charge of uh, both houses. And we talk about in the city, there's a lot of rhetoric about the fact that we live in the reality of uh, two, two cities, 
the poor and the rich. And so it's within that context that I'd like to frame what I would think would be an add-on beyond the next 2020 that hopefully you will, because in terms of your ability to be able to be impactful, there are a lot of things that we need to learn from you in terms of how you go about doing it as we introduce another layer of the dimension. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read the 10-year report that's called uh, for the food policy in New York City since 2008. But it's a significant document because if you don't, if you're not familiar with that document and that 10-year history that covers some 20 public reports, some 420 recommendations, 37 food metrics indicators, and the top 40 policy issues that were being emphasized, you don't begin to understand where we're coming from in terms of a, across the country in general, not just New York City, what has become the new add-on agenda to the work that you're doing. And a lot of this has to do with three issues or three areas that are normally not addressed and not even part of the ongoing discussion at almost any food conference that one attends. The first of it is amongst the six areas that were to be emphasized, three were totally neglected in terms of the reports over that 10 year period. One of them having uh, creating food systems that support economic and community development, which is really interesting because even if it did, there's a whole new redefinition that's emerging around what community development around food means. And that that whole thinking has not really kind of sank in, sunk into this discussion. The other area that was neglected was support of food workers, because almost none of this could be done if we're not willing to support our food workers. And if you think $15, I don't know how many people in this room are willing to raise their hands and tell me they could live in New York City earning $15 an hour. Raise your hands if you think you can. Yet, notice, not a single hand has gone up yet. That's what we're fighting for. I thought at least in one hand. <laughs> okay. Uh, the other area that was totally neglected has to strengthen food governance and democracy. So that if we don't, because part of what you're doing is also doing that. And I think it has to be done in a different way. But it's interesting in terms of New York City, and in the report that was done, and Craig, you folks really need to take enormous amount of credit for that report, which I think, how, how many people are familiar with that report? Okay, good, good. So therefore there's a context uh, that I can talk about, okay? It means that if we think of those three areas, governance and democracy, supporting food workers and economic development, <clears throat> we, have to start talking that there's, let's talk about community development. There's a, there's the knowledge that there's a uh, definition of community development is being redefined by many blacks and Latinx. Not in a traditional way and that we have talked about community development. Uh, there are a different set of processes. And so one of the things that one of the things that we must think about as we think of new policies uh, really has to do, thank you. Too many drugs, folks. <laughs> uh, one of the things we have to talk about is what does this legislation look, need to look like? So that for instance, we now have a new, we just passed in terms of the last election, uh, a new, a new piece that brings into, into place a citizens participation panel. What is that going to look like? What are the real goals of it? It's nice to talk about citizen participation. How meaningful is that going to be? So that we, we think of community budgeting process. That's really one of those things in which that is not the same as a community in an advisory role. And folks, we have so many advisory roles and I have advised, I've been on committees that have advised and advised and advised and advised. 
and I don't see any of it necessarily reflecting in what communities necessarily say they want. And so what we're really talking about is the shifting of decision-making power. And if we don't think about shifting decision-making power, then I don't know what it means for democratizing the whole area here. Uh, the second thing that the other piece of that dimension is we have to intentionally, and I know folks don't love to hear this, we have to intentionally filter these policies and their impacts and their measures around racial equity. And so it's, it's fascinating to me that in democracy, in much of the report, uh, the metrics for measuring any of these things were not there in those reports. So that we can talk in the generalities that we normally do. Okay, let me just kind of make this brief, because I, I think you would, you'd like to do that. And I can pick up a lot of these themes in terms of the discussion. Uh, we have to talk about what participatory research really means when we talk about the community, uh, what the community had a voice. What does that mean in terms of participatory research? We act in environmental justice 20 years ago, 30 years ago, set up a completely different model in which they were the PIs, the principal investigators, and Columbia University was the subcontractors. So we have to talk about all of these particular relationships. Uh, and we also have to talk about it in terms of a new economy that's being created. And, the, and how do we create this new eco economy? We see snippets of it in the city council in terms of the money that they've put in for training for co-ops. But there's so many different ways in which we can talk about what that new economy should entail that we have to talk about what should those policies be, what are the metrics for that, and how do we keep folks accountable. Let me leave it there for now. Uh, you know, this is not a, this is not a real, let me say, you know, it doesn't include the masala and all these other ingredients that should go into this new menu, but I think you get a sense that uh, where we're going in terms of our own thinking. And quite frankly, we can't do any of that work if you don't continue to do the work you're doing. And I think what we're talking about is how do we layer these structures? Thanks. Panelists could come and have a seat on the stage. We'll get started for the discussion portion. Thank you, Dennis. And you know, a lot of what you talked about really is about envisioning what the future can and, and should look like. And um, you know, that's the the ultimate you know, motivation for democratic participation, being able to shape what the future of your society looks like. And um, but how we get there is very complicated, and you know the current political environment you know, dictates that you know, certain tools that work now in order to affect political change may not be the best tools for the future. And you know what we want to talk about today is how do we get from where we are now to where we want to be. And I'm going to start off with a question for you, Robin, since um, you're the only person we haven't heard from yet. Uh, Robin Vitale is the Vice President of Health Strategies for the American Heart Association in New York City. Uh, again, if you want to find out more information about Robin, you can check out her bio in the flyer that's available over there on the table. Um, so Robin, you've worked a lot with uh, elected officials. So in the wake of the midterm elections, what sort of food policy related issues are you hopeful about seeing progress on over the next two years? Which are you a little bit more cautious about? Thank you so much, Craig, and, and really happy to be here on this this panel with all these esteemed professionals. Um, you know, it, it's fun to kind of that cleanup after both of you have had a chance to kind of do this outline and the deep dive. Um, the Heart Association, um, I should clarify, as a 501c3 organization, we are not in a position to be able to do half of the fun work that Karen's able to do in DC, really getting into um, the, the battlegrounds um, with some of these very key um, significant issue areas. And we are not political, we're legislative. And uh, we're able to uh, work with anyone once they're elected. And we have to figure out how to motivate those individuals regardless of what their ideology or, or personal life perspective might be. Um, 
it can be challenging at times to exist within that that paradigm. Um, but uh, we're we're very interested in how things have evolved over the last few months um, since the midterm elections, and I think we're looking with um, a decent sense of aspiration that there is hope <laughs> that we can try to start advancing some of these um, significant uh, food policy needs. Um, yeah, I'll certainly defer to, to Karen and the focus around some of the, the federal initiatives that we're hoping to, uh, to rally around. I know we're um, all as a, a society very interested in what's going on with uh, the public charge rule that's, uh, that's coming to a head, um, as well as the farm bill and other issue areas. Um, we're certainly um, concerned about what the current administration has been talking about in D.C. and, and how they've gone about um, sidestepping some obstacles and, and coming to, uh, to you know, terms with, with their base versus what, uh, what the larger communities really need. Um, I think at the state level, uh, we have some, some real significant opportunities as we're looking at um, a, a new paradigm um, of power in the state Senate um, and obviously matching that, that power influence in the House um, or in the Assembly in our case. And uh, I'm thinking about what that potential new legislative landscape can look like. Um, for, for years, we've seen out of the assembly significant um, support to uh, underserved communities, thinking about how those voiceless um, in New York, um, across the state of New York, have an opportunity to benefit from public policy. And, and certainly, food is a uh, part of that, uh, a significant area of concern. Um, it's always been challenging, however, to match that same culture on the state senate. Um, the state senate had often been more influenced by economic concerns. And uh, a lot of the topics we talk about on the, on the food um, scale as, um, as well as others impacting health are at times very costly. And uh, shifting that, that economic structure around can be um, challenging in the, the onset. And so we're very interested in how this, this new um, state senate and those that are coming into uh, positions of, of influence um, on the, the health committee and um, other committees that can help move this forward um, can help to really prioritize that. So in that space, we're looking at things related to healthy food access, um, thinking about how the, the state in the past has done some significant work around um, what's called the Healthy Food Financing Initiative. Um, there was an existing program, Healthy Food, Healthy Communities Fund, for more than a decade um, that resulted in um, a good 25 new food markets being built around the state of New York in communities that needed that help the most. Um, that program is no longer being funded. Um, it has gone away as a result. So something that had been very successful um, is no longer operational, which is obviously um, concerning. Um, but we're also looking at uh, the things that relate into child health as well with food, thinking about school wellness policies, nutrition standards, um, things that can uh, really, I think, be motivated significantly um, in, in this new, new landscape. Um, so we're excited about the potential. Uh, I would say that we, we have a healthy dose of caution. Um, because as we're already seeing, as the, uh, the powers that be are being settled in Albany, um, there's going to be a lot of distraction. They've been, uh, especially on the assembly side, able to talk about their priorities for decades now, about what they would do if they had complete power and influence. A lot of promises were being made to, to various constituencies. Um, and so now that they're actually in that position to get things done, um, there's going to be a, a significant uh, volume of, of opportunity. Everyone's going to want those promises to, to fall um, into place. And what does that mean? What does that look like? And have the food policy priorities, um, how are they going to be prioritized? So I would say we're, we're healthy. Uh, we're uh, you know, in a very healthy position thinking about the, the progress of food policy work, but realizing that we're going to have to be very loud in our approach. Great. Thank you. And Karen? I want to direct the next question to you. Considering today's political environment and the wide range of concerns about where the country is headed on issues related to you know, climate change, you know, immigration, et cetera, which food policy issues do you think could resonate the most in this current political period where we have really a number of very high profile issues that aren't necessarily food related that are you know, taking up a lot of the the energy and efforts of activists? I think that a lot of it will come. Good. Uh, I think a lot of it will come down to what affects people's everyday lives the most. Um, 
that's one of the reasons that we fall back on that food safety example so put a little closer okay that food safety there example so much um, is because it's something that really is in the background until it's not and when it's not it's very dramatic um, so I do think that a lot of uh, people's priorities around food will be around access and access to healthy food and then affordability um, of course economic issues are always huge uh, in any election uh, and food is one of the uh, one of the biggest uh, we also find that messages around health really resonate uh, with with voters that people do understand the link between what we eat what our children eat and what that means for their future um, and so those kinds of issues I think will continue to be um, increasingly important as well and do you see common cause amongst folks who are concerned about the environment who are concerned about immigration etc do you see common cause in some of those topic areas that you could say okay well this aspect of you know, policy X could relate you know in a very clear way to environmental policy or immigration policy etc I do think I do think there's been a lot of progress in that vein I think that uh, there's a, a lot of great coalition work that's happening to bring together uh, you know sustainable agriculture and uh, people who are snap advocates um, and even if you look at large environmental organizations they might have somebody that's um, dedicated to agriculture policy now or food policy where they didn't um, you know 15 or 20 years ago so I do think there's growing recognition of how these issues intersect but of course when it comes down to the specific priorities uh, that's always going to be difficult to negotiate at the last minute um, or difficult to when it comes down to the details of um, what a specific policy actually uh, actually does but I think there's been tremendous progress in working together yeah, and I think that level of difficulty is one of the reasons again why it's important to have these sort of conversations early so it's not at the last minute that everyone's trying to come together in order to you know, push a common goal it's something that's been thought through discussed and you know the sort of organic path forward is already apparent as opposed to trying to figure that out at the last minute um, Dennis Corbin Hill's always been focused on increasing food access and creating new pathways to ownership and wealth creation how can we convince elected officials that changes to existing food policies could be one of the ways of addressing the racial wealth gap in New York City and around the country yeah I, I really think it's important that we talk about the uh, the wealth gap because it's a word that we never use when we're in our community <clears throat> it's not part of the vocabulary of any of the discussions that go on at these meetings and the reality is I think there are two distinct uh, areas one has to do uh, that has to do with the income gap based on salaries that's very different from the wealth gap and I think that really what we're talking about is uh, to what extent can we now create the kind of uh, community wealth in which the investments in our community around food is not one that's extractive in nature fundamentally that's really what has been happening uh, there are many people who talk about the bodegas and so forth and I'm not thinking of them because I can think of bigger examples that uh, that in terms of the city government and so forth has invested money in but almost all of them are extractive in nature uh, communities own very little we cannot even talk about wealth they think about us in terms of low-income communities as simply consumers we're not economic citizens uh, and to participate in that kind of economy an economy in this city that exceeds five billion dollars yet at the same time this is what I'm saying that complements what you're doing because I think what you're doing is necessary but I guess in my own mathematical training I normally define it as necessary but not sufficient uh, and so how are we going to deal with this racial crap now we want to know what we have what we have been talking about and there are a whole series of groups black and latinx groups across the country who have been there's so many meetings going on on this whole issue of community wealth and so forth that is it's just really stunning and they have begun to define a whole series of actions and how things should be shaped and formed and the processes involved and the importance of community uh, ownership 
in terms of the decision making and so forth. There's even a hint in some of your reports that even all of the 15 to 20 uh, stores that were built, brick and mortar pieces that were built for, for in, across the city, that many of the people in the communities are not that particularly happy with them because they don't feel any sense of ownership. And your study really kind of hints to it. Doesn't quite say it that way, uh, Craig, but you know what I'm saying. So that I think, you know, uh, we don't have all the answers because fundamentally what we're doing is we're struggling in terms of a new economy uh, that's trivial in nature to the regular ongoing capitalist system. And we all have our foot, our feet in one or the other or in both and trying to figure out how we mix and match and make this work for our communities. Because all that's involved, and in, you just have to take a look at the, uh, the, the underwriting laws and all of the discrimination that's, that's built into those uh, underwriting laws. But we don't talk about those kinds of things at food, at food conferences, you know, and why we can't, we in the community can't own things. So it begins in a very fundamental way for us over the next two to three years to begin to build that constituency the way you have been able to build yours, uh, to identify the elected officials who are, be, who are going to begin to marshal around what we see as a longer term visionary vis, vision about what it means to create wealth in communities. And that's a discussion that there's very little, well, only recently in the last two or three years, you've begun to see some particular writings about this. And that educational process with elected officials will take time. And then with uh, term limits and so forth, it complicates it when you can do it. Just the time you've nurtured people, they may decide not to run or may not win, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to also develop the kind of scores and the metrics that measure where they are on all of this. Yeah, and this, this concept of the racial wealth gap is one that is creeping into a lot of different policy areas, not just remaining in the area of poverty, but also being talked about and how that can be used in order to transform in food policy, environmental policy, et cetera. And you know, one of the, the sort of promising developments is that uh, a component of this racial wealth gap uh, issue or racial wealth gap discussion has been baby bonds. And um, I'm forgetting, uh, Corey, Derek Hamilton. Derek Hamilton, but uh, why am I not remembering his name? The Senator from uh, New Jersey. Cory Booker. Cory Booker. Booker recently put out a position paper in favor of baby bonds. I don't know where that's going to go, but again, this is one of these discussions that you know will start to become increasingly a part of the overall picture of what how we transform not only just the food system but also uh, the economy and society in general. Uh, Robin, I want to ask you in assessing the current political landscape and with an eye towards 2020, and considering your experience working with elected officials in the past on food policy, advocates should try to avoid and seeking to gain political traction for food-related causes. And you mentioned that you work across the spectrum. And I think depending on what the various positions that advocates are coming from, there can often be a mismatch in discussion and conversation around how you get your point across. What do you think that they should be mindful of moving forward? Oh, those, those mistakes that we make at times. Yeah. You know, I, I think that themes that have been brought up um, by my fellow panelists really resonate with this question specifically because you really need to do your due diligence when you're speaking to the elected official that you're hoping to cultivate as a champion. Um, learning what's going to motivate them, what is their background, what what is uh, their, their uh, district look like. Um, you know, when the new city council came in um, over a year ago, we, uh, the Heart Association, took a deep dive and, and started to, to really learn a little bit more about these, these new council members, the, the individuals that are coming in as new chairs of, of targeted committees. Um, our speaker, obviously, um, being the past chair of the Council Health Committee, we already had a very wonderful relationship with him as a champion, and so that was a, a pretty easy transition to take place. Um, but a really quick little story, um, we had um, some meetings with individuals that were going to have uh, some influence over um, access to places to be physically active, um, thinking about parks and recreation and so on. And um, some of those conversations were not as successful as they probably should have been 
um, because we went in there with the assumption that um, there was going to be an understanding that there are communities in New York City that lack this access. And um, they're looking from the lens of their own district that have had um, the benefit of geography and, and investment. And um, they did not easily initially understand kind of what we were trying to advocate for. Um, so that has evolved over time, which is wonderful. But it's definitely, I think, something that um, we need to embrace in the food policy world as well, uh, realizing that um, Right now, both in Albany and, and certainly in, in New York City with City Council, and we do have, I think, tremendous synergy with our elected officials. They, they, they get it, they understand it. Many of them are, are very passionately embracing progressive um, policy um, you know, standards. Um, they all want to kind of carry that banner for us and, and you know, really drill down into, we want to you know, help the, uh, the, the communities that need to help the most. Um, but you never want to go in there with the assumption that that is going to resonate across all boundaries. So thinking about what is uh, going to motivate your uh, your key influencers, um, is it the economy? And I think one of the great things about food policy is that it does it transcends all of those boundaries. Um, food certainly equals health, food equals medicine, but food equals jobs, food equals economy. And and thinking about um, how you message that and how you um, can can make any food policy a priority through those lenses um, has to be part of your your strategy. Great. Yeah, just want to add to that because uh, this whole sense of what what I fear most in terms of uh, what I fear most in terms I saw you sign but uh, what I fear most is the fact that uh, our elected officials and too many people in public accept what Derek Hamilton calls eleven myths about wealth creation, so that more education will get us there. Well, the reality is, you compare across race and across gender, that is not true. I mean, they, and so you have a whole series of myths that I think it's so easy for elected officials to kind of fall into the trap of saying, oh, yes, we can do some more of this. You know, home ownership is going to really create wealth. Uh, well, the reality is it hasn't in terms of what, it, what it's worth. Or that more, uh, more savings on the part of low-income folks. Well, we already know low-income folks proportionately they give more to non they give more to nonprofits than anybody on a proportional basis than any other group, and we know that they save more proportionately. So all of these kinds of myths that exist that sort of don't deal with the underlying structure of racial equity, ac uh, access to to assets, you know, in terms of uh, uh, capital, uh, really is the big issue I worry about in terms of errors that we would make, and that we it's so much easier for them to perpetuate the myth and deal with the underlying truth. Karen, uh, you talked about two particular races that your organization focused on. Are there any other races that, based on the electoral outcome, that you're uh, confident that because of the changes that we're going to see in the incoming Congress that you'll see some movement on a particular food policy issue? Yeah, more than, more than any one particular race, I really think that it came down to how close so many of them were really unexpectedly close. In some cases, just 50, 50 Right. Votes. I mean, like, as I was, you know, writing my keynote, I was like, some of these are still undecided. Um, so I, I think that that will really inform, um, that will inform people's approach in the future to kind of hone in even more on the really small, but like getting out every vote that can really make a difference. Um, I think also we saw a lot of, um, state level change. So for instance, in Colorado, Colorado is you know, now pretty solidly blue. The governor that they elected, uh, Jared Polis, he was a member of Congress that had a 97% on, uh, on our scorecard. Um, so you know, that, but Colorado has one Republican senator and that person is up, Cory Gardner is up for re-election in 2020. So those kind of changes both in the demographics of a state and the politics of a state, um, I think are going to be very important going forward. Um, I think also the expansion of the electorate uh, through measures to enfranchise people, uh, like for instance in Florida, um, that of course also is going to have a huge impact on who is able to vote um, and the importance of turning out people to vote. Thank you. I think in the interest of time, we're going to move on into the 
question and answer period. Um, microphones will be floating around. If, uh, if you have questions, raise your hand and a microphone will be directed towards you. So any questions? One right there. Actually, I have a, a statement. I'm uh, Linda Laviolette from the New York State Department of Agriculture. I'd like to all thank you for your work um, in this area. I have a suggestion. We developed a tool while, at, while I was at ESD called the Community Food Systems Assessment. And I think that that could be a valuable tool for communities to build support for uh, food, uh, food policy. You can do it. Carlos Menchaca, the, the councilman from Sunset Park, has recently uh, done a community food systems assessment in Red Hook. And if you do it in the community and you do it yourself, you're building a coalition of community groups around issues that are really targeted for what that community needs to do. And that can be a very useful tool in, in driving food policy. I'm happy to share that with, with anybody who would like it. I mean, there is a business that has, has grown up around the country with hiring consultants to do these community food systems assessment. They can cost between 50 and $100,000. And honestly, there's no reason why communities should pay that money. They can use this template. They can build a coalition in their community, and they can use that to, to, to drive local food policy. And for those who don't know, ESD is Empire State Development. Right. And uh, what's the name of the tool again, if you could repeat it? The Community Food Systems Assessment. And we're, we're happy to make it, um, I'll, I'll provide the information to sure. you. Sure, we, we have it, but I mean, for, for others. important point and thank you for bringing that up to everyone's attention. Another theme that we should probably touch on as far as the potential for mistakes in advocacy is to not utilize resources like that and to not focus on the need to, to prioritize or elevate the community voice. Um, I, I think Derek's focus on, on some of the um, inequities that have inadvertently or perhaps inadvertently happened over time and um, with some of these policies being put in place that didn't have the community focus. Um, we want to make sure that uh, truly um, impactful food policy is being community led, community driven, and it's going to have the type of intended impact that we want to see achieved. So whether it's using a tool like that that really builds that assessment um, from the ground up so that we know exactly what it is that's going to benefit that community um, or making sure that the coalition partners around the table truly represent the community voice that has to be a priority as well. Thanks for bringing that up. Other questions? In the back. I, I heard you say 20% um, was average score, little close. average little score for Republicans. Um, I heard 20% was their average score. I was wondering, um, maybe I missed it, what the average score is for Democrats. Yeah, the, the average six-year score for Democrats in the House was 93%. Uh, so there's definitely a pretty, a pretty stark divide. And that certainly doesn't, um, that's certainly not every member. Um, it is a, a nonpartisan tool. So um, there are, you know, very, uh, higher scoring Republicans and, and lower scoring Democrats for sure based on their positions on some of these policies. Um, but definitely it reflects the party's uh, priorities over the six years that we scored, particularly the leadership because food policy action, we can only score uh, floor votes. Those are the things that we have, you know, information on everyone's vote across the board, to be fair. Um, and the House leadership determines a lot of what gets to the floor and gets voted on. And unfortunately, um, in a lot of cases, those were very, very partisan uh, bad bills. Uh, yeah, I, I like to uh, throw something in about this business of uh, creating wealth in a community. Um, I am uh, the team leader for Plant Pure Communities in the Bronx. And um, I am 
along those lines, very involved in teaching people a whole food plant-based diet. But uh, one of the things that uh, is, is difficult is to get support for, frankly, things that don't cost money. You know, as soon as there's money involved, you get all kinds of people showing up. But if it don't cost money, and some of the solutions are the best. For instance, I found out in the last few years there is a not-for-profit that uh, is called um, the Suppers Programs, and it was started by a lady in New Jersey who had a health problem and needed to follow a diet and was having a tough time getting support. And what she did was she created the support system for herself at home by doing with other people that also need to follow the diet a mutual support system where they cook alternately at each other's homes and share the grocery bill and whatever, and it costs nothing. The host collects the money, goes out, shops for the grocery, and the group shows up, and you cook together, and you eat together, and you clean up together, and that's your meeting. And that's fantastic, and it literally costs nothing other than the food you were going to eat anyway, you know? And uh, I've been bringing this to the attention of people in my community, organizations and stuff. But like I say, I have this feeling it just falls on deaf ears because there's no money involved in doing it. <laughs> and that's just one example, and there's probably a ton more. There's, a, there's so much that we can often do. Uh, you know, and other things are, we have the example of Eric Adams in Brooklyn, who is a tremendous driver of change in this area. And I'm aware in the Bronx of at least two politicians, uh, Fernando Cabrera and Luis Sepulveda, who uh, themselves have had equally dramatic experiences as Eric Adams in this area. But, uh, you know, I don't see them really out advocating it the way Eric Adams is doing. So the next thing I'm doing is bringing Eric Adams to the Bronx and put them all to shame. So that's that's another thing we can do for free. Thank so you. I, I want to ask the panel, what do you think of this idea that, um, and from what I'm hearing is that, yes, there's not a, a dollar amount, but there's an amount of time and community investment that goes into you know, putting something like that together. What do you think of this idea of, you know, community investment, community time, resident time versus investment by the city or the state in funds in order to be able to have a standalone version of that that's that's funded, that's operationalized in a very formal sort of way. Do you have an opinion on, you know, where you would like to see policy move towards more supporting what what our, our director calls a community constructed food environment versus the market constructed food environment? Not only community, uh, absolutely, I would like to see funds being put into the whole community investment piece. The, uh, the, it, and this goes back to, this goes to what I'm talking about is the future, because we don't know what those models would really look like and how we would want to write that legislation. And I would want to be very careful before I, we sort of commit to voting on these kinds of things. And I think that what we will see over the next two, three years, four years, is a series of demonstrations around these kinds of things and trying to, trying to find the political support uh, with maybe through, you know, council persons uh, independent grant or whatever the case may be in which we can create a series of models of what's possible. I mean, so we're, we're in this, we're in, we're in an interesting period in which we don't really have all the answers <clears throat> and we have to really kind of test a lot of the notions around what do we mean by what is really community participation, decision making, and ownership. And I think that these are pieces that, you know, we throw, uh, I throw them around sometimes. Uh, if pushed to help the, to define each and every one of them, it's not easy. And I will tell you that up front, that I don't have the answers necessary to all these definitions. But I think it's a process that's going on across the country in which you're all struggling to define these things. And if you can get it translated to the point where the kinds of programs that you're talking about get supported, we'd be in great shape. We do need to consider the, the balance between the two. Um, there's so many examples of innovative health policies that start in the community and, and really thinking about what is going to resonate within 
those residents, um, whether it's a supper club idea or, or other aspects um, that are going to be really embraced by those neighbors. Um, however, we also need to make sure that work is going to be sustainable beyond that one individual, that, that woman in New Jersey who started this concept. What happens when she's not available to do that kind of work anymore? Um, so the, the benefit of having something codified in law is that it transcends the individual. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, when we have the opportunity to advance public policies, that we are leveraging all of that innovative work that's going on in the community, making sure that legislation is going to be drafted in a way that is going to have the most um, benefit for these communities, um, but making sure that we are able to, to codify this, institutionalize it, operationalize it, um, so that it is sustainable for the long term. Emma, in the back. Your microphone's coming to you. I work for Bronx Health Reach. I know many of you. Um, still, there we go. Um, so I am very optimistic overall nationally about the political changes. Um, locally, however, I'm still a little bit worried. Um, as most of many of you know, um, the Bronx is 62 out of 62 in health outcomes and health um, behaviors in the state. Um, we have many challenges. Um, and we need a radical change, like a really radical, radical change to actually make things different. Um, we do talk about the wealth gap, the racial wealth gap, but I just wanted to hear your thoughts again about how do we make that radical change? How do we work with existing and new electeds in the Bronx to actually do something different? And sort of what is the role of our governor? Um, is he an asset or potentially a barrier, um, especially considering his potential run for president? Yeah, uh, there's a lot to unpack. And <clears throat> I don't know if you've been following many of the discussions that's been going on within the Black and the Latinx community around the wealth, the wealth issue, and uh, we're all still struggling to try to get that defined. Uh, what we're really talking about is a new economy. That's when, at least, that's how I define what you talk about is, you know, a radical change. It's clearly, it's clearly capitalism has not worked for low-income folks. It's worked very well for me, but, you know, that's because, I don't know, maybe because I came out of the 60s with a PhD, okay? And so I was one of those exceptions where even then I still had to fight the bank for over a year before I could get a, a loan, the first one in my neighborhood in Harlem for a reconstruction loan. And they're telling me things about my debt to equity ratio is not right and so forth. And I says, I have to look at the banker and ask him, do you know how to, do you know how to calculate one? Because I can calculate mine for you right now. And you're absolutely wrong. But that kind of level of, of the frustration around, it's not just the racial gap. It's, it's, the, it's what I would call the racism that underlies almost all of this stuff. And this is why you have to start thinking about a totally new economy, a total redefinition of what community means within that whole structure. What does it mean to have, you know, we keep hearing all these wonderful phrases like win-win. There's no such thing. I mean, say if you read this recent book that calls winner take all, you begin to understand there's no such thing as win-win. And so how do you redefine this? And how, I think the biggest mistake that we make, I, I love foundations, I do use their money and they do give me money and I'm not gonna knock it. But the reality is, they're not equipped to deal with the structural issues. Most people forget that less than 10% of all foundation funding uh, goes to low-income communities or ad address low-income issues. Less than 10% of the billions that's given. And so we all have, the first thing we all, we all think about is, how is this foundation gonna help us do this little project? The, real, the reality is the nature of the problem is so large that you have to think about a new economy and how do you bring capital into that new economy where you don't have those underwriting laws, where basically you don't even have to begin to, to pay off the principal for 10, 15 years when you, have, when you are profitable. And we know what profitability means in the food area. It's not that obvious. So it's a very complicated issue and I think that uh, the fact that the discussion is actually surfacing is in itself, to me, I'm very optimistic, even though I don't have the answers. And I do want to just very quickly follow up 
on that'll, item of... That'll be the last word. Okay. <laughs> no pressure. Um, but I do want to you circle back to your focus around kind of the landscape that you have in the Bronx and, and kind of the, the viability we have on some of those um, policy areas. Um, I think the Bronx, especially because they are in the you know, worst rankings, um, the not Sukuju campaign um, is going to be extremely relevant moving forward. The political power base is in the Bronx. You have your speaker, obviously, for the, uh, the, the assembly. has been in office for, for many, many years and, and a speaker for many, many years. Um, but you now also have the chair of the Senate Health Committee. Um, and I think it's going to be incumbent for all Bronxites to make sure that these two individuals particularly hear from you, hear from you often, continue that outreach, making sure that all of the, um, the promises that have been discussed over the last several years are going to be priorities for them moving forward into this new, new paradigm. Um, you know, Gustavo Rivera is the incoming uh, chair of the Senate Health Committee. He's a wonderful uh, you know, champion on many of these issues, very outspoken, very passionate about a lot of the uh, inequality concerns and, and, and so on. Um, now it's, it's time for him to, to flex some of those muscles and making sure that, uh, that those promises are going to, to meet reality. Um, so I think I'm extremely optimistic about the potential for some good things to be happening for the, the borough of the Bronx. And I, and I would just add that I think one of the um, sort of unintended positive outcomes from the Trump administration is that, you know, he has taken an approach of constantly activating his base. And that in turn has meant that people who are on the left have felt the, the same need to be able to constantly activate their base. And that sort of, you know, for lack of a better term, war footing nonstop, I think, ultimately is something that needed to happen at some point anyway. And, you know, if it happened because of the way in which Trump has been, you know, administering his, uh, his policies and his approach to activating his base, and it forces others to do the same thing, it moves us further along in order to see change much more quickly than we normally would under conventional political circumstances. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you to the panelists. Um, very, very good discussion, interesting and engaging. And thank you to all of you. <clears throat> One final note, we do have another food policy forum. We typically have them every month coming up on December 18th, and the topic is Growing Good Food Jobs in New York City. Uh, we recently uh, released a report focusing on the various opportunities for jobs in the food system that pay a decent wage, that have benefits, some sort of pathway for advancement, and we'll be getting deeper into that discussion on December 18th. So if you're interested, please come. Uh, our CP will be going out very, very soon, and there's also a flyer on the table with more details. Thank you. Thank you.